Bir Organizasyon için sevgili piyanist Anna Fedorova ve kontrabasçı Nikolas Schwarz birlikteyiz Ukrayna'ya barış konserinde bir aradayız. Hem müzikal hayatlarını hem de toplanma amacımızı derinlemesine değerlendireceğiz bugün. So hello again. It's so nice to meet you guys in person and I'm so thrilled. Uh, so thank you. And um, before we get to start, how do you find Istanbul and how is the feeling till now? What would you say? Well, uh, so far it's been really gorgeous weather. I think when we arrived here, it was suddenly much uh, it's more summer than it has been. So for us coming from uh, north of Europe, it's very nice to be in this summery weather, but also to um, Yeah, to be here in uh, Istanbul for the first time, it's really, yeah, we've had some nice time, but also we were stuck in traffic for some of the time. So we, we actually haven't seen too much yet, but we, uh, we look forward to going out on the water tomorrow and, uh, and seeing yeah, a bit more of the city. Uh, yesterday we uh, started, or we arrived late in the evening, very tired after a long flight, but then we immediately went for absolutely delicious dinner with uh, typical Turkish kebab and also desserts, which probably became my favorite desserts since then. I don't know what's the name of it, but it's uh, this something crispy and inside there is cheese or pistachio and oh, it's maybe just kinefe. possible <laughs> that, yes, but <laughs> it was absolutely amazing. And uh, yeah, we're extremely happy to be here. It's our first proper time in Turkey and first time performing in Turkey. And uh, also it's very special to do today this extra concert, which came up quite spontaneously, but uh, to perform this concert for Ukraine, which is really special for us. I would like to ask uh, some details about the aim of the concert and this concert series. But before that, I would like to ask about your duo. Uh, like, how did you um, end up together and um, why a duo and why oyster duo? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, the story starts um, when we, we were both playing at a, a chamber music festival in Brazil, mm -hmm. and my double bass um, didn't make it on the plane. So I, I had checked it as baggage with a big hard case, mm -hmm. and in Lisbon there was a baggage strike, and no bags got on the plane. And I arrived there with nothing but my bow case, and I sat there next to Anna, where, and, it was so late and they had just closed the bar and she gave me her last drink because I guess I look like I really needed it. <laughs> and um, uh, now we are a married couple. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and and we, we love to play together, to travel together. So it's um, yeah, very uh, easy for us to, to yeah, to to make music together because we we influence each other so much in life and in music that it's very natural and we came up with the name Oyster Duo because one of the first times Anna was uh, coming to Amsterdam to visit I, I was already living there um, we would go to the Norder Market which is on Saturdays and they had this uh, amazing uh, oyster kind of table um, and we were just having the oysters thinking, well, what should we call ourselves when we, <laughs> when we perform together? So cool, so casual. <laughs> but then it came with something, actually oysters are something really refined, really um, exotic and really, um, really special tasting and really, you know, really unique and, and we love. Sometimes people don't like, but we love. <laughs> and but also, also there is connection with uh, boats and oysters, right? So I, I, I'm not 100% sure what exactly this, uh, but something about boats is also with oysters. And uh, we both love sailing and we love ocean and sea and water. So somehow for us this uh, connection was <laughs> quite special and then just as a joke kind of half a joke we started to call ourselves oyster duo but then somehow joke became more of a reality and mm -hmm. just became official name as well <laughs> cute and um you mentioned that you influence each other and inspire each other as a couple as partners as well i was gonna ask that and um in which ways and uh, how would you describe the um, differences between working together and uh, being together in real life, like how do these two concepts affect each other? 
Well, uh, first of all, uh, probably I should also go back to Brazil because uh, uh, at that festival that where we met in Brazil and we fell in love there as well. But for me, the moment when I started to fall in love with Nicky was at the concert when I was listening to him because uh, him as musician, as an artist, and uh, also in general, we believe that through the way how a person plays, you can also feel the uh, personality and the soul of the person. So for me, that was the moment when I was absolutely amazed. First of all, I never heard anybody playing double bass like Nicky. And uh, it was a, a chamber music group and it was a Trout Quintet, which now is one of our favorite pieces to perform together also with our friends. Uh, and I somehow caught myself that while I was listening to the performance, I was mainly listening to the bass, which is very unusual <laughs> because of course there are so many rich uh, parts and melodies in the, uh, but as an artist, he was so standing out and, uh, performing so fantastically. So uh, since then also, well, we fell in love, but also we really wanted to play together because uh, this is just joy of making music together and uh, feeling each other as musicians as well is uh, really uncomparable. Although I must say that also our biggest fights we were having while rehearsing. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I guess that's a normal thing. And if this were the biggest fights, then I, I yeah. think that's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are constantly practicing and performing together, and and that kind of over time, that uh, that amount of, of togetherness, it 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 makes it so that we don't really have to speak about music, how we're going to play. We just uh, if something doesn't work, we will just do it again, and and we we can feel each other's sense of timing, sense of uh, musicality. And that is um, something really special when you perform and play so much together with your yeah, duo partner. And, <laughs> yeah. to take a look at the very, very beginning. I know that both of you have musician parents, classical musicians. You have uh, your father and mother there, um, classical pianist, I guess. And uh, your father loves music, but your mother is uh, a professional again. And um, in one of your interviews, I saw that you uh, said you hated going to concerts back then, like when you were a kid. And um, now, how did that, that feeling translate it, or uh, does it translate it, or is, is it a concept that has them all? And for you as well, um, like how did it shape, like it, did it came uh, naturally, or um, it was the influence of your parents? Like how would you describe the path? My parents tried to get me to appreciate classical music when I was a kid, but it didn't really work because I was into rock and roll and uh, skateboarding and all these kind of things. Um, so I only took to classical music over time when I started to play double bass. I started actually with an interest in jazz music. And that's uh, when you start to learn uh, an acoustic instrument, you, you have to go through the classical training. And that led to playing in youth orchestra, that led to doing uh, summer camps. Um, and then it led to when I had to decide about, you know, to study professionally in college, then I, I went towards classical. But um, that background in jazz and other kinds of music, it, it still influences me today. Um, it's means that the classical music it must not be stuffy and boring, but it must also have some real uh, inner drive and energy that, that other music has, and that it has itself internally. It just gets the reputation of being a bit sometimes dry and uh, old fashioned, but. And uh, for me, it was, well, since I was born, more or less, because both my parents were very actively involved with performing, teaching, listening music as well. They were both 
uh, teachers in uh, Kiev Conservatory and Music School for Gifted Children. So they, our house was constant uh, musical, uh, uh, musical house, <laughs> I guess, where, where the students were coming and going. There were different recordings playing. My father was constantly practicing. My mother was rehearsing with some chamber music partners and also practicing. So I don't remember my life without music. And uh, very naturally, I, of course, also wanted to start playing, started to learn what I can also do with the piano even before my parents started to really teach me. I was all the time going to piano and just trying something. But then actually since I was four years old, they started to teach me and then I, I played at my first concert when I was six. And uh, then I started, went to my first competition where I won first prize when I was eight. And uh, my yeah, real professional performing career started when I was 16 years old, I guess I could say maybe 15, but really active one when I was 16. And since then I didn't anymore have probably normal life. I, also when I was 12, I didn't have normal life. <laughs> I was practicing six or seven hours per day and <laughs> that's probably yeah, not what usually normal kids are doing. But uh, I, yeah, I was always very excited and fascinated by this uh, world of uh, classical music. And uh, especially when I discovered also the chamber music making with really amazing musicians, which inspire, which when you give each other energy, give each other musical ideas, that also helped me a lot also in developing myself as a solo artist as well, because with this way you also learn a lot. And uh, yeah, so I guess that's my story. <laughs> And um, I'd like to ask a question about live concerts and recordings. Um, how is your presence, your energies are shaped um, when you compare it with a recording and uh, on a live concert? Does it change or um, how is it shaped? Yes, uh, well, I love both. I, I love also recording CDs. It's in a way very different uh, process than just performing one time a live concert for the audience. But it's also a very fascinating process when you can uh, perform once and re-listen yourself, find certain things which you didn't really like. And you, you kind of have in your imagination and in your ears the perfection and you're trying to reach this perfection when you're recording a CD. And it can be a very inspiring process. I, I really don't like when CD recording and the up being work to make sure there are no wrong notes. That's mm -hmm. not the way to do it. And also the recording engineer we are working with and producer is also absolutely against that. So we rather would have several full takes, but where the inspiration is there, the musical line is there and the uh, uh, performing vibe is there rather than working on specific uh, notes which were wrong or something like this. So it's one amazing process and uh, performing live concerts, that's uh, something what absolutely cannot be replaced with CDs, I think, or with live streams, which we of course had to do a lot during the last two years. Mm -hmm. And it was a great opportunity still to perform, even if not for the live audience, but at least for the audience around the world through the internet. But it's not instead. I mean, we were missing this whole time the live audience because the uh, sharing this energy also with the audience and uh, 
the music making of the moment in the room. It's, it's always unique, it's always uh, gives much more emotion, much more uh, energy and uh, magic than uh, if you're watching it through the screen, <laughs> of course. Yeah, we had a lot of experience doing live streams in the last couple of years. And um, the diff biggest difference I see is that for me, it's no matter if it's a concert or a really live stream versus a recording, is that it's you have one chance and that this is, you know, it gives that extra uh, drive that you go for it. And uh, unfortunately, what started happening with streaming is that people realize actually these are going to be online forever. So we have to do retakes. And so there was actually never a moment where it's like, this is the, the moment. So the whole performance. Doing it a lot, but this is the moment. Yes, but uh, <laughs> a lot of times there was like, okay, we have to do that again or that part, and then, then you will totally miss the inner energy, um, and the concert, live concert experience is, is the full, uh, you know, full meaning of that. That you have. Um, you know, a room full of uh, people who you, uh, yeah, you you have to 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 play to, and and you have to give to, and you also give get something back when you have a live audience and you feel that energy that and that gives even more that you have to really, um, yeah, put put out your best. Describe music. Uh, so there was piano for you at the very beginning, and there was contrabass, and now cello. How would you place cello uh, right now when you frame your uh, musical approach? And for you, uh, besides piano, which other aspects and maybe other instruments, um, genres, melodies um, there are that you are influenced? Uh, well, for me, I did play when I was uh, small, also one or two years, I played violin as well, all, together with the piano. But then somehow piano completely consumed <laughs> me because uh, the piano repertoire is so rich. The pianists always have to practice the most out of all the other <laughs> instrumentalists. And uh, especially now also with uh, extremely busy schedule and also because I'm not just focusing on solo repertoire, for example, but I also love chamber music and I play a lot of chamber music. It makes the amount of music I have to perform throughout the year really big <laughs> and rich. So uh, it's hard to find possibility to learn another instrument, although I would love to play cello as well, for example. I, I really love this instrument, this color and the expressivity. So I, I think if I could learn another instrument, it would be cello. <laughs> and uh, out of genres, um, we, for example, we love playing tangos and we perform a lot with uh, bandoneonist Marcelo Nisinman. He's Argentinian with um, Polish origins. And uh, we have um, also, well, it's a kind of not official group, but uh, the group of musicians who are also performing with him a lot, and we are all friends, and we often play together, and that's something a little bit not completely typical classical music, but it's also not really some other genre, it's just the genre of itself, the tangos. And uh, also I had some of the experiences of playing with a uh, jazz pianist. We had uh, some interesting projects where uh, we were playing actually also together with Nicky and with him, the jazz version of Appassionata, Beethoven's Sonata, uh, where I was kind of representative of the classical side. He was representative of the jazz side, but then we were mixing it and sometimes we were improvising together. Sometimes uh, we were having parts where we would play together, but 
like a little bit changed version from my side from what would Beethoven write, but that it would somehow mix together in a new uh, way. <laughs> and uh, also Nicky had his own moment of improvisation and it would be extra beginning for the second movement. And that was very exciting and also something new and something what in a way was uh, making myself more free also when I'm performing the uh, in a normal way, the classical music. Um, so playing double bass and playing cello are, are, are quite different, but the main thing for me is that I'm um, showing myself as a musician, so it doesn't really matter what instrument it is. And I always felt as a double bass player that it's not um, that I'm a double bass player, but I'm uh, just playing the double bass. <laughs> And uh, that's, people always told me that I play the double bass like a cello. And somehow over time, I just, yeah, with the, the limited repertoire, which double bass, unfortunately, is uh, kind of, was never really um, appreciated by, by the composers of one, 200 years ago. It's only had its relative um, rise to uh, to be a more of a solo instrument in the last like 50 odd years so um so we have to yeah we have to adapt music from that was written for other instruments or or some new music and the cello repertoire is, is not as big as the pianos but it's still there's fantastic music written by you know beethoven by brahms Shostakovich, all, all these great composers wrote cello sonatas with the piano and uh, all, all chamber music, a lot of chamber music with, with cello, string quartets and uh, piano trios and all of that is like a whole new world that opened up for me in the last five years that I've been playing. So it's really exciting um, at this stage where I've kind of become like a professional, but I I started new again in the middle of that and so now rediscovering um, what the possibilities are because nobody really does this. It's, <laughs> it's similar but it's very different and, and, and it's uh, not uh, typical for double bass players to, uh, yeah, to take it on like that. But uh, Something also maybe to add about, uh, uh, yeah, the ways that we were rediscovering also classical music during the corona times. We uh, did a number of projects where we would mix it with other art forms. So for example, we would have concerts with uh, poetry where we would match different poems with certain pieces of music and it was a very beautiful experience because then you kind of like dive into this magical world where music adds to the words and words add to the music. And the same thing we were doing also with the videos. We were choosing certain pieces of music which would really trigger our imagination that sometimes you just feel like you see the story in there or you have certain associations which you really feel when you perform and you try to express it with the music. But then we tried to actually visualize what we have in our minds. And we made a number of videos for specific pieces of music and then we performed with these videos so that the listener can actually see what we're imagining when we are performing. A total art frame, having music, visuals. So. Yes, yes. And uh, tomorrow, I think if everything goes well and the projector will work and we can <laughs> make it technically work, we will actually perform several pieces with uh, the videos which we made especially for them in this way. <laughs> And for today's program, how did you uh, pick the pieces for today? And also your album, Stolen Pearls. Um, will there be some pieces from that album too today? Uh, tomorrow, I think there will be. But um, yeah, how, which pieces will you have today and tomorrow? Question. We. Uh... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you forgot already. No, or how did you pick? Like, you don't, of course, have to uh, <laughs> list, but. <laughs> No, well, uh, actually, when we recorded the CD, that was kind of before I started to play <laughs> the cello. So, so the, these couple of pieces where we are playing um, both, we yeah, we try to yeah explore a bit 
how it can be done where we we, we uh, certain parts of the piece that maybe enhance it with the double bass and the higher voice suits it better in in the climaxes for instance where vice versa so i actually will be changing mm -hmm. during the piece um that's not on our album yet but um uh, but we are going to be playing the uh, Badassini Tarantella, which is actually more like a showpiece, and it's the last piece on that album. It's it's entitled Stolen Pearls because all of the repertoire is actually written for other instruments, but this one is like the encore of the album that's uh, written by a double bass player for the double bass to really showcase what it can do. Um, that will be the last piece, piece on the program. Uh, and we will start with um, the Ukrainian piece uh, by Miroslav Skorik. Uh, Miroslav Skorik is a very important Ukrainian composer. He died a couple of years ago. And uh, this particular piece called Melody, and uh, lately it became maybe one of the most popular pieces performed at all different uh, concerts dedicated to Ukraine during the war. Uh, because, well, it was already before that uh, quite popular piece in Ukraine for sure, but also outside Ukraine sometimes played. But now it became almost like a classical, uh, like a spiritual anthem from the classical music side of Ukraine. And uh, he wrote it for the movie. It's uh, the music, uh, yeah, for the movie which was called High Pass. And uh, the director of this movie, uh, it, the movie was shot during Soviet Union and there was censura and uh, many things were controlled. And like he, for example, couldn't show or say certain things that he wanted to show in the movie or talk about in the movie. So he asked Miroslav Skorik if he could write in the music everything he couldn't say or show in his film. And basically that's how this piece was born and it's, uh, incredibly beautiful, emotional, uh, dramatic. It has, uh, uh, yeah, maybe an essence of Ukrainian soul <laughs> in it. So we will open the concert with this piece and this will be also played on bass and cello. We made a special arrangement for <laughs> this concert. And um, yeah, and then there will be another piece from our CD, uh, Stolen Pearls, uh, Hinastera, five songs. I think we're playing it yeah. today, no? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and that's uh, originally written for voice. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's not very known piece even for voice. So somehow Nikki discovered it and he thought, oh, maybe we should make arrangement of it. It seems like it could work very well on bass. And it does work really well. <laughs> it's an exciting piece and, uh, yeah, and also beautiful, with amazing colors, which also shows off the whole range of uh, the instrument and uh, yeah we made also with the last part of this uh, suite I mean not suite but five songs with the last song we actually made the trailer for our CD uh, where we are stealing the pearls <laughs> in literally <laughs> <laughs> but this yeah this is possible to see online on YouTube or something but that's quite an exciting little video <laughs> okay and lastly uh, not to hard uh, push you hard before the concert um, let's talk a bit more bit about the aim of the concert you already mentioned um, peace for Ukraine and I guess you'll be doing 12 more shows and you will uh, donate the incomes from these shows and um, also there is a foundation of you uh, to help children and to inspire them in a musical way as well. Um, how would you comment on it and describe it? Yeah, so we, uh, when this whole situation started, we really uh, dove into doing uh, doing benefit concerts to try to help uh, however we could from far away. So we were raising a lot of, uh, of well, not just money, but also kind of feeling uh, and a reminder about the situation which was happening there. And uh, we made ourselves very, very busy with that, um, raising over half a million euros uh, for humanitarian uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. And we, at that point, uh, decided to focus on um, Ukrainian uh, musicians who have come to the country we live in, the Netherlands. 
to uh, support them in their musical studies. And um, there are six pianists who we found host families for uh, who, with, with instruments, with grand pianos. And we are now uh, raising money in a foundation. It's called the Davids Bündler Foundation. Our, our new uh, academy is called the Davids Bündler Music Academy. And um, it's, it's called that because it's, it's, it's a term that Schumann came up with for his um, society, which is very kind of open-minded, progressive, and, uh, um, and forward-looking, not, not old-fashioned. Like old <laughs> yeah, yeah, people of art and... Uh, um, and uh, we, we are now yeah, participating and, and organizing um, concerts to, yeah, to, to raise money for, for that. Yeah, but not only for that, and it's actually still not only 12 concerts, there will be many more. Uh, the 12 concerts, that's a specific tour which is organized by Metropolitan Opera and uh, Polish uh, uh, Opera Theatre and Ministry of Culture. And uh, this is, uh, uh, yeah, it's a very big project with uh, the orchestra, I will be playing Chopin's second piano concerto as a soloist with them. And uh, there will be a big tour in uh, nine European cities at uh, some of the very important festivals like BBC Proms or Edinburgh Festival or Orange Festival in France and uh, also in very important halls like uh, Alpha Philharmonie in Hamburg, Amsterdam Concertgebouw, uh, Berlin Concert House, uh, Albert Hall in London, etc. Uh, and also in the States in Lincoln Center, two concerts in New York and uh, in Washington Kennedy Center. This will be the end of the tour there. Uh, but that's a project that we didn't initiate, but I was just invited to be their soloist. But also the funds which will be raised there will go to uh, help of Ukrainian musicians, specifically musicians. And I, I think it goes to Ministry of Culture of Ukraine, something like that. Until now, you already um, have some income, right? So you donated a but lot until, until now. now yeah. Yes, from only concerts which we did for uh, the humanitarian organizations for Ukraine, we raised over half a million euro. And uh, now, recently, we started also doing separately concerts for uh, helping specific uh, Ukrainian musicians, young musicians for scholarships and... Uh, yeah, other help in which are now in the Netherlands, but also in a couple of weeks I have also concert with Dana Zemtsov in Austria in Linz, and this will be specifically for Zaporizhia, is a city in Ukraine, so for help there or maybe rebuilding some damages, but basically specifically for this city in Ukraine. And uh, yeah, there will be many more, I'm sure. So, so far we played at least at 30 benefit concerts for Ukraine, I think, with, together with yeah. Nikki. In the, last, in the last two months. Yes. Yeah, and um, so that was all my questions. Were... <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice place, nice, place, nice ambience. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys, thank you so much for your participation sure. and uh, I'm looking forward for the concert, thank you. Çok değerli iki müzisyen Anna Fedorova ve Nikolas Schwarz'a birlikteydik. Az sonra konserlerini izleyeceğiz. Kendilerinin Ukrayna için barış konseri için toplandık. Bir sonraki röportajımızda görüşmek dileğiyle.